Jesus says that the church, the, the wineskin, is going to look different based on the wine, the people, that need to fill it. The wineskin is going to look differently based on the wine inside of it. And we all here today are wine, so to speak. Um, hopefully there's no word count on Adventist sermons uh, for how much I bring up the word wine today. But we all are here together wine in the parable that Jesus shares. And that brings us to this question of wineskins. How can we build this church into the wineskin that Jesus wants us to be? The church that Jesus calls us to become. If we have old churches that are rooted deeply in tra tra uh, traditions, do we keep those transitions? Or do we toss them out simply because they're old? Or do we keep them simply because they've worked in the past? Do we ask God how he can help us to renew and reform and renovate these spaces to better incorporate new wine and new uh, people coming in? And if there's a balance in between, what does that look like? And how do we navigate that balance? Well, in order to learn how God makes something new, the wonderful thing about the Bible is that we actually have some frameworks to look at to see how God made things new and how God had church, you could say in quotes, happen throughout all of history, throughout his people worshiping him. We can look and see how God created church throughout the Bible, how people came together to praise, to worship, to lament, to, to commune with, and to spend time with their creator and their savior God. And today, we're just specifically focusing on Jesus and what he says in the book of Luke. And when we do that, we're going to see three themes emerge. Three themes emerge. Um, I, I'm trying, just so you know, I'm trying this out. This is Pastor Jeff's. If, if, I'm not holding a magic wand or something. But this is Pastor Jeff's, and so that's why I'm smiling at Jill, because this is our first time doing this. Um, so bear with us. Um, when we see that, we see three themes emerge, three biblical elements that Jesus defines as what church needs to be. Three things that, without them, it's not church. It's not really what church is meant to be. Maybe it's a building, maybe it's people gathered together, maybe it's people worshiping, but it's not really the church that Jesus has called us to be. No matter the, the context of the history, no matter the, the drama that's going on within the church, it's these three things that make church, church. So let's talk about that first element. That first element that appears in spaces of worship throughout scripture. The first element is words to God. Words to God. That means prayer, probably most easily or essentially. Words to God means prayer. And maybe that takes shape in the, the opening, the closing, the congregational prayer. Maybe it takes place in a song of, of prayer or request. Prayer, uh, believe it or not, is essential to making church, church. It's essential to a whole worship or a church service, but also a community of believers as a whole. When we think of prayer in the Bible, particularly when we think of Jesus speaking about prayer, it's probably easy for us or most natural for us to think about the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus said, this is how you should pray. And then we copy and paste uh, that prayer. Uh, the good students here know that that might be plagiarism, but that's okay if it's the words of Jesus. And we call prayer good. But what if the Lord's Prayer wasn't Jesus just saying, here's exactly what you should pray every single time, but how you should pray? Jesus actually talks about prayer other times too. One of uh, the ones that we're going to be looking at today is actually found in the book of Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. In this story that Jesus is sharing, two guys come to the temple to pray. They're coming to a place of worship, which we might think would be enough for Jesus to be happy about, to have two people coming to worship God. They're stepping into church. But watch what Jesus says about these two. 
Let's imagine that these two are coming to church today. Starting in verse 9, Jesus told this parable to certain people who had convinced themselves that they were righteous and who looked on everyone else with disgust. Two people, Jesus said, went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself with three words, or with these words. God, I thank you that I'm not like everyone else, crooks, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I receive. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even lift his eyes toward heaven. Rather, he stuck his chest out and said, God, show mercy to me, a sinner. I tell you, this person went down to his home justified rather than the Pharisee. All who lift themselves up will be brought low, and all those who make themselves low will be lifted up. It's two very, prayer, two very different prayers, two very different stories indeed. The first guy is your modern-day uh, Pharisee. He's a, a theology major that has gone through seminary and he has his Ph.D. He knows his Adventist doctrines and the writings of Ellen White like the back of his hand. All good things, all good things. He went to private Adventist Academy all the way K through 12 and graduated with uh, honors at Southern Adventist University. Uh, this guy is on uh, Ted Wilson's notice list for a potential replacement someday. This guy knows how to do prayer at church. We all know there's people that know how to do prayer at church and some that were like, ah, oh, that was all right. There, he is regularly asked to do an invocation or a pastoral prayer or a congregational prayer at, at large churches and will undoubtedly be asked to say grace at the Sabbath haystack feed. He comes into church knowing the prayer that not only God wants to hear, but also the entire congregation. He knows how to write it out with his thesis statement, his body paragraph, and his conclusion. He knows how to pray. The second guy is a tax collector, a modern-day businessman, uh, a frat boy with a, rep a rep uh, reputation for partying hard and showing up to church uh, maybe with a hangover that he tries to hide. Maybe he was raised in church, but he left it all behind long ago. This guy has some tra trauma in his life, but he pushed forward and made his life a successful one, albeit without God. Now he reaches a point in his life where he realizes there is a hole in his heart and he drives up to church on a Sabbath morning. Nervously, he walks inside. He comes to a quiet area towards the back of the church and he prays the best he knows how. Now we're beginning to see some stark differences between these two people. One is coming with complete confidence in himself and his own holiness, and the other with complete insecurity and desperation. Jesus is happy that both are in the temple. Both have come to church this morning, but he wants his disciples to pick up on something about their individual prayers. He says, the Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself with these words, God, I thank you that I'm not like everyone else, crooks, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I receive. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even lift up his eyes toward heaven. Rather, he stood and, and he stuck out and beat his chest, and he said, God, show mercy to me, a sinner. Two very different prayers. For the Pharisee, the guy comes to God, and he says, God, thank you for blessing me. Did you catch that? Sometimes we don't think about that. Uh, we, we read it, and we read it just as cocky, as arrogant, but in, in some ways, you could interpret the Pharisee's prayer as saying, God, thank you for blessing me so much more 
than other people. Thank you for blessing me with worldly things and good status, God. Thank you for not making me a, a poor person. Thank you that I'm not like those other people that are struggling or in danger. Thank you for blessing me because I'm a good Christian. I give a tenth of everything I receive. I fast twice a week. I come to church and I do everything right. Thank you for seeing what I do and for giving me what I deserve. It's an issue of pride, yes, but how often do we maybe say prayers that sound similar to that? When we pray, we are saying thank you to God because of the grace and the peace and the mercy that he's shown us. Are we saying that? Or are we saying thank you to God for not making us like one of them? This might not be something for all of us, but I want to point it out because we usually say thank goodness. We don't pray like that Pharisee, but maybe we do exactly the same thing in our own life, in our own context. For the tax collector, this would be a prayer that would seem irreverent to many. Unlike the Pharisee, there is no proper structure learned in English class. There is no uh, address, dear God. There's no body paragraph. There's no thesis statement. There's no conclusion on, in your name. Amen. There's none of that. He simply comes and he says, God, I don't deserve to be here, and you aren't obligated to give me anything. That's not even a prayer of request. He doesn't say, I, I'm a sinner, but, but could you please just uh, help me through this thing? He doesn't say, God, I, I don't deserve it, but I'm still asking something from you. All he does is he simply comes to a place of worship and he places himself at the mercy of God. And who does Jesus appreciate more? The one who came saying, thank you for all that you've given me that I am owed? Or the one who simply came to experience and to speak to and commune with the Almighty God. Jesus finally says, all who lift themselves up will be brought low. And those who make themselves low will be lifted up. If you come to God and you're looking left and right to put yourself up, you're not going to do too great. You've got to make yourself low. And how do we make ourselves low when we come to God? Well, as individuals, we've got to not do something. When you're talking to God, we've got to not talk to ourselves. We've got to talk to God. Don't peek those eyes and uh, chuckle to yourself about how someone has raised their hands or is crying to themselves. And that may sound harsh, and maybe it's more for other churches than for here as well, but uh, let's, let's think for a second. Why do we close our eyes in the first place? Is it because Jesus doesn't like to see our eyeballs when we pray? No. It's because it helps us to remove the distractions as we place ourselves before the throne of God. Don't close your eyes and fold your hands just because you feel that's the proper position. Do what helps you focus on simply the vertical connection, the vertical relationship of prayer in that moment. When we sing songs to God or we have communal prayers, reflect on the words for yourself. Not just what the elder is sharing or what the person is saying, but, but what does it mean for you? Let the words you sing, the words you speak, the words you hear be an offering to God, not of pride, but rather of placing yourself before God. If that for you is to raise your hands, if that's for you to have your head bowed, your eyes closed, your hands folded, if that's just a silent reverence or a vocal praise, find ways for your words to God to be simply vertical, to not be interrupted by or affected by those around you. That's one element. That's the first element of what we need to have if we want to be a church. We need to have words to God. We need to have prayer. But as we have prayer and as we create spaces for prayer in church, we need to be thinking about what that means as individuals, our personal, individual, vertical relationship to God. Don't be like the Pharisee. Be like the tax collector. But we don't bring prayers to God for no reason. 
We believe in a God that interacts with us. Something else that's necessary for making church what God wants it to be is to have words from God. Words from God. And this might come more naturally for some than others. The idea of God speaking to us or in some way communicating to us is the reason why many of us come to church in the first place. Whether it's through the music, through the scripture, through the sermon, or, or through anything else. We come to church hoping that God will speak to us in some way. Maybe he'll speak to our needs. Maybe he'll answer our prayers or our words to him. Or maybe he will speak to us in a way that we didn't even know we needed. But as there is so often when putting together a church, (laughs) trying to put it together perfectly, the way that God wants, there's a problem. It would be wonderful if we could say, hey, welcome to church, we have words to God, now it's time for words from God. But the problem is, if you haven't noticed, that life is busy. Life is busy. I don't know about you personally, but it seems so often that there is just this noise of life. There's responsibilities, there's expectations, there's wants, there's needs, there's things to look forward to, reflections on what you said last week, and the noise of these things, it never gets quieter on its own. And unfortunately, when you walk through the doors of this lobby or in the doors of the sanctuary, uh, it doesn't magically have a noise-canceling effect on all the noise that's happening in your life. All the drama that you're going through, the things that you're struggling with, the responsibilities you have to look forward to in your work week next week. So, let's read again from Luke to see how God expects us to hear him in the noise of life. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus is he's dealing with a lot. The Pharisees are questioning him and his disciples as to their actions on the Sabbath. They're picking grain on the Sabbath, and Jesus heals a man's hand on the Sabbath, both of which are deemed to be working on the Sabbath against the law of Moses. Jesus debates with the Pharisees about what actions are pleasing to God, and he knows that they're trying to trap him. Verse uh, 11 of chapter 6 here says, they were furious and began talking with each other about what to do to Jesus. Jesus knows they're trying to trap him. Not only are they trying to trap him, they are trying to find a way that they can have an excuse to kill him. That would be pretty noisy if you were in church and you knew somebody was out to kill you. Not only are people clamoring for Jesus' attention constantly, And there's good people that need things from him, people that need healing, people that are seeking to learn from him, good things that are taking up his time. Jesus also had people plotting to kill him at his every turn. They're trying to trap him in his words, so to get him to say something wrong. That's a lot of noise. When life is creating that much noise around you, maybe you don't have somebody plotting to kill you, but maybe you have uh, what feels like that at work, at school, a teacher out to get you, a boss that wants you to do every single thing perfectly and sooner than physically possible. When life is creating that much noise around you, how are you supposed to hear God? How are you supposed to receive words from God? Well, in the very next verse, let's see how Jesus handles the noise. How does Jesus listen to his Father? Luke chapter 6, verse 12 says, During that time, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night long. What does Jesus do? He gets to a place where it's quieter. He physically removes himself from some of that extra noise from his life so that he can prioritize hearing the voice of God. And that's not so easy for us often. Uh, Because often there's things that we actually can't get away from in terms of the noise in our life without being able to to tell you how to get away from the noise in your life, from the responsibilities that you have. Maybe you have kids, maybe you have parents, maybe you have, well, hopefully you have parents. Maybe you have something in your life that you can't get away from in terms of responsibility. Without me being able to tell you how to get away from the noise in your life, 
and acknowledging that there are some things that we can't get away from, I want you to notice something about the language that Luke uses in verse 12. That first word of verse 12, during, during that time, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night long. That key word is during. As Jesus was dealing with people constantly needing him, as Jesus was dealing with people plotting to kill him, as Jesus was trying to fulfill the role of the promised Messiah, during all this noise, Jesus took time to go out to the mountain to find a place to hear the voice of God. Now, that doesn't mean it's an easy thing, but that's what Jesus knew he needed to do. How are you making space to hear words from God today? If church is going to be a place where we can hear God speak, we we need to find a way to turn off the noise. And there's ways that we can do that as as church leadership. Maybe we can create spaces, uh, different elements of the worship service. But it takes more than that. Church can't just be a place where we, we hear ourselves talk. Although God so often speaks to us through each other, we need time to hear what God has said, and we need to find ways to create space here where we can hear what he is saying to us right now. But that isn't something we can do alone. Maybe you can silence your cell phone, but church isn't just a one-person event. In fact, it's meant to be at its best when we're all here together. So as we seek to create a church a space, a wineskin that is what God has called us as a church to be. We know we need to have a space for words to God, a space for prayer, a space for us to to pour ourselves out to God, to, to bring ourselves like the tax collector before him. We need to have a space where we can hear from God, reading from scripture, hearing what how he speaks to us, maybe through the music or through the different elements of the service. Finding ways for ourselves to focus on the voice of God. But this third element brings us up to something else. One of my favorite uh, stories from American history is uh, about this, a guy named uh, Roger Williams. Anybody ever heard of Roger Williams? Um, back when we had history classes. Um, Roger Williams coming to America. Uh, I, I, this guy is, is he's really funny. Not only is, is his portrait kind of funny, but uh, he, he's, he's a great guy. Um, he's remembered because he did some really important things. He, he came to America, he, he founded uh, the region Provin- Providence, and, and he founded a church. But this story is, is a lesser known story that I, I've always uh, found to be rather uh, amusing in, in, uh, in maybe some good and some bad ways. He comes to Providence and, and he founds a church. This is uh, before the time of the United States of America. He's in America, he founds Providence and he starts a church. He's so excited to be in this new place, starting this church, and people start showing up to his church. But a problem comes up, again, as so often does with the church. A problem comes up, and a division arises. The issue is so divisive that Roger Williams feels he needs to step in, he needs to pick a side, and he says, you guys on that side aren't welcome here anymore. This is a church that believes this way. It causes the church to split. And you'd think maybe then, now that that group was gone, the matter was settled. But something else comes up. The church splits again. The church keeps on splitting and splitting and splitting until it gets down to just two people. Roger Williams and his wife. And you have to wonder how much of that was just her sticking by him. It gets down to just two people. And the funniest part is, an issue arises in the church. And he tells his own wife, "Uh, you don't belong in this church anymore. I don't know if they stayed married. Maybe it was too too early for divorce, but uh, yeah. One person in a church. One person in a church. What did he even do? Roger Williams, when this happened, when it got down to just him, I wish it would have happened to him a little sooner, but when it got down to just him, he realized something was wrong. 
Something had to be wrong, even though every step of the way, every split felt like the right decision. Choosing the side that was right, the side that he believed in. Even though every step of the way he did what he believed, something was wrong. Even though he felt like his vertical relationship to God was intact and was right, his horizontal relationship with those around him was was non-existent. Eventually, he figured out some things for himself and started getting people back together. He learned from his mistakes, but it's still a crazy story. What was wrong with what he did? What was Roger Williams missing about church? Let's finally talk about that third element about what makes up church. That third element is community. Community, fellowship, communion. And it makes sense, right? Because so far, we've been thinking vertically. We've been thinking just about words to God or words from God. We've been thinking about our individual relationship with God, which is vital to church taking place. But as we've talked about prayer, we've talked about not getting distracted by others or not making it about judging others, but just bringing ourselves before God. And when we've talked about words from God, we were challenged to find ways to, to silence the noise around us. Maybe that means the individuals that are around us and create space in our individual lives for God to speak to us. But there's a problem. Those are the elements of the answer to the question, what is church? They're the first two elements, but they don't complete the picture. Prayer you can do on your own. Scripture you can read on your own. God can speak to you on your own. But community, that requires something more. Something different, something beyond just you and God, something beyond just you and what you believe, something more than just me and God. Community community requires not only a vertical relationship and an interaction, it requires a horizontal relationship with those around us. Once again, in the book of Luke, chapter 10, Jesus runs into another guy. Happens a lot. And the guy asks him a simple Yet all important question. He asked Jesus, what must I do to gain eternal life? Essentially, he's asking Jesus the question of questions here. How do we do life right? How do we do this time here right now so that we can get to the good side of the afterlife? It's important to to note, though, that this is not just any guy This guy is a legal expert, Luke says, which means that he is an expert in the law of Moses. This guy isn't just some sleazy lawyer who knows some loopholes. This is the guy that tells the priests how to act because he knows the law of Moses so good. He is a legal expert. And Luke doesn't say he was just curious about what Jesus thought the answer to this question was either. Luke says he stood up to test Jesus because he knew what the answer was, but he wanted to see what Jesus had to say. He has carefully curated this all-important question in order to see what Jesus has to say, which is great for us because we get to see Jesus answer the question that he asks. So he asks, what must I do to gain eternal life? Jesus flips the question, as he so often does, and he asks the legal expert, what he thinks. The lawyer responds, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And what does Jesus say about his answer? He says, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Do this and you will live. That's the answer to his question. If you want to do good here, if you want to live life right so that you can get to the good side of the afterlife, Jesus says you have to do two things. You have to love God with all your being and you have to love your neighbor. So in everyday life, not just at church, you should be loving God and loving your neighbor. That should be your goal for your everyday life. As a disciple of Christ, we want to be loving God, working that vertical relationship, but then also loving those around us, the horizontal as well. Most of us have no problem with the loving God part of church, right? You go to church, you come in, you sing some songs, you hear a sermon, you go on with your day. 
um, feeling good about fulfilling your Christian duties. But church is more than that. It has to be more than that. If you want to avoid the Roger Williams-style church of one here at Laguna Niguel, church must be a community. Church must be loving neighbors. Church is where you come, yes, first to love God, but also to love your neighbor. If Laguna Niguel is going to be a church that thrives until Christ comes again, if we are going to make this space a wineskin that is good for God to pour people into for eternity, we must commit to community. So, here at Laguna Niguel, I want us to commit or recommit ourselves to growing and fostering community. This church is already so good at it. We're good at welcoming strangers, at, at, at being a family. But what if we could grow and enhance that culture of church family? A culture where each and every one of us believes and acts out the idea that if you're a part of this church, you are going to be seen, you are going to be loved, and you are going to be cherished. But that takes something. That takes more than just me and God. That takes more than just what I believe or what I can share from the pulpit. This is about a community. Creating this community that loves our neighbor requires all of us. All of us must choose now to love God and to love our neighbor. Let's not keep working our way down to churches of one. Let's build the kingdom of God. Let's commit to loving God, to loving our neighbors. Let the love of God rush over us so that we can spread that love and have it pour out over this church. Let us see and be the love in this world. So what kind of wineskin will we be? What kind of church is Laguna Niguel? Are we just an old wineskin? Are we going to just be a new wineskin? Are we going to be a, a church where God can take old things and make them new? Do we want to be a place that Jesus can bring old wine and new wine? People who are new to church and old to it. And pour them into this place and do powerful things through this church and through this congregation. It's the kind of church we want to strive to be. And if it is, we need to commit to three things. Not just the church leadership, but each and every individual here this morning. You see, as a church, we can, we can and do commit to having our services include these three elements. Words to God, words from God, and community. But as much as church leadership, we can create spaces to try and make those things happen. All those things won't happen if you don't commit to making them happen for yourself and for those around you. If we want to become a church, a building, a congregation, whatever it is that God wants church to be, if we can become a church that is committed, each of us, as individuals to spending time in a vertical relationship to God and focusing on the horizontal relationships around us, then, and only then, will we be the kind of church that God calls us to be. I pray that we will be the church that God calls us to be. Amen.